I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord and let us exalt his name together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. We are so grateful that you decided to join us as we worship and praise God in spirit and in truth on today. Let us bow our heads in prayer of invocation. All wise and eternal creator, Abba, Father, Daddy, Mother God, we come before you this morning, oh God, just to say thank you and to say that you're welcome in this space. You're welcome in our hearts. You're welcome in our minds. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in this place. That when we leave this place, we will not leave like we came, but we'll leave excited to run on to see what the end is going to be. It is in the marvelous and magnificent in the miracle working magnanimous name of Jesus Christ, our healer, our redeemer, our helper, and our friend that we pray. All of God's children said, amen, amen, and amen. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth on this morning.
How we are glad to be in the house of the Lord on today. How we celebrate and we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. How grateful it is to be in the house of the Lord. We declare that this is the day the Lord has made. We have come to rejoice and be glad in it. And we are glad to be in the house of the Lord. For God is worthy. God is able and God does provide even in this season. We are so glad, so grateful, beloved, to share with you on this Sunday, amen, as we continue to worship in this month of August. We are grateful for all that you are doing and all that you have done. We seek your prayers and continue to share with you. We want to thank you so much for continuing to fellowship with the New Calvary Baptist Church, but we do believe that God is up to something here and we are faithful uh, in our work and in our effort. We continue to pray for you in this season to keep you safe and pray that God continues to to grant you peace and understanding even in this transition. We pray that you are keeping safe in the heat, my Jesus, amen, that you are keeping safe in this heat because uh, it is not playing. So continue uh, to work and to labor together. We are uh, just going to share uh, in and hope and pray that you are enjoying our celebration of our uh, remixes. We are listening uh, to some oldies but goodies on our Wednesdays in this month of August and sharing with our preachers from our summer madness schedule. And we hope it is indeed blessing you. You know, New Calvary, we have been blessed with some powerful preachers over the years here. Uh, and so we are grateful for um, the opportunity to just refresh and to hear uh, some of those outstanding preachers that have been a blessing to us and we are continuing to hope that you are being spiritually fed uh, even in this journey. want to just remind all of you that we are continuing to uh, share um, and uh, in our giving we are grateful for all of you who continue to give uh, and faithful and just be reminded that Giblify uh, is the reason, a way to give to New Calvary your tithe and offering. You can mail your offering and tithe in as well, or you can stop by during the hours um, that are available from 10 to 2 during the week uh, for um, our church office. We're grateful for all of your uh, participation, grateful for your faithfulness, grateful for your energy and effort as we find new ways to come together and to do the work of ministry uh, and what God is doing with all of us. We're going to take this time just to pray with one another and share uh, in grace as we ask and invoke the Lord's presence in this moment to speak to our hearts and to give us encouragement in this moment. So if uh, you need or asking you, why don't you just uh, put your prayer request in in the uh, uh, comment line and you can continue uh, those you want to pray for or those situations or whatever it is that's happening in your life. You might take this moment to just pray so our virtual ministers can acknowledge and pray for you in this moment. So if you will, just bow with us in a word of prayer. Gracious God, how we thank you. We love you and we are grateful for this day in which you have made. Continue, Lord, to pour into us and feed into us, God, this moment as we continue just to move forward even in this season. God, we are in this moment of celebration. We are in this moment of fellowship. We are in this moment of gathering and worship. But God, we also have moments in our lives where we are in seasons of the unknown. We pray, dear God, that in this season, as there are many who are making their way back to school, as there are many who are making their way and planning uh, to get routine back for the fall. We are praying, God, that there are parents and households that are trying to figure out what they are going to do, even in the midst of this pandemic. So, God, please, we're asking for your hand. We're asking for opportunities, asking for places, asking for resources, Lord, that help us to strengthen us and keep us, that we might continue not only to be safe, but we might continue to grow. 
because God, we need our children to be educated. We need our, our, our parents uh, to make sure that they make it to their jobs. We need the income for our household. So God, we're simply asking that you would show us how you provide in this moment. We need you, Lord. We make no mistake how bad we need you. Make no mistake, God, that we are praying for those who are searching for answers in this moment. But we do believe, Lord, that you have them. We do believe that you're creating possibilities day by day, moment by moment. We pray, God, for everyone on uh, in this virtual worship experience. We pray for every household. Pray for every parent. We pray for every child. Pray for everyone who might be struggling with health issues. Pray for those who might be dealing with emo issues of emotion. Pray with those who are dealing with their psychological anxieties in this moment. Touch them all, God. Touch us all and that we might feel and be reminded of your power and your presence. We don't take for granted, God, that you're still walking with us. And we say thank you in each step. We say thank you with each moment. We say thank you with each move. We are grateful that you're still God all by yourself. We're grateful that you're still working things out. We're grateful that you're still providing. We ask, God, that you would just continue to touch us. And all things will be faithful. And all things will heed. All things we will listen. And all things we will give your name, the praise, the honor, and the glory. For it is, God, in the wonderful, marvelous, and matchless name of Jesus, the people of God who love God together say amen, amen, and amen. Come on, as we continue to worship together, come on, put your lights up and put your hearts up as we receive, amen, our praise and worship team as they bless us in this moment, amen.
Amen. The Lord is worthy of our praise. Amen. Amen. God, how we thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Grateful, dear God, for the time in which we are here. Reveal to us, dear God, your plan, your purpose for our lives. Even in this moment, we give you praise, honor, and glory in all things. Thank you, God, for continuing to pour into us. And we will seek and continue to hear a word from you. Bless this, your instrument, dear God. Allow me to decrease while you increase so these people might see and hear your word, your music of grace and mercy. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of thy grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and let my will be lost in thine. It is in the wonderful, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus, people of God who love God together say amen, amen, and amen. We are grateful, amen, for our praise team blessing us on today amen we have indeed been blessed amen 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 those of you uh who are uh posting and asking questions uh on my shirt on my shirt is fanny lou hamer uh and uh El, um, ella baker Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker are on the shirt. This is when they were at Democratic Convention. Uh, I believe it was 1971. So these are two powerful, strong sisters who uh, I believe we need to honor uh, as ancestors. And so those of you who don't know uh, who Fannie Lou Hamer is or Ella Baker, look them up. Amen. And then give me a report on them. Amen. Or give me a book report. Amen. I call your attention to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, uh, the 12th chapter. Jeremiah, the 12th chapter. I've been waiting to preach this. It's been on my heart for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, actually. Uh, as a matter of fact, before I got sick, I was going to preach this for the graduation and promotion. Um, um, but I guess we can put it together now. Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Uh, here, here as it is translated in the New International Version, it says, You are always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them, and they have taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, O Lord, and you see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land lie parched and the grass in every field be withered? Because those who live in it are wicked. The animals and the birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying, he will not see what happens to us. Here's God's answer. If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? Amen. If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses. If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? I want to talk for a while from this idea, my brothers and sisters, from this thought. The marathon continues. The marathon continues. When Hermias Ashkadon, also known as Nipsey Hussle was unfortunately gunned down in front of his own business in Los Angeles, California. It opened the eyes to a greater and larger scale to the world, an individual who just didn't rap on CDs and mixtapes, but a businessman, an entrepreneur, an innovator, who saw more than just dollar signs like rappers, who moved beyond the bling, but who saw empire. 
Lipsy was a spirit that saw empowerment in a moment, and he understood that getting to where he wanted to go was going to take hard work and constant pushing forward. On his mixtape titled, The Marathon Continues, Nipsey says on the bonus track, that's why I call my thing the marathon, because I'm not going to lie and portray like I had it all figured out. Nah, I just didn't quit. That's the only distinguishing quality. Nipsey said, what sets this apart from everything else is that I don't quit. I keep moving. I keep hustling. I keep pushing forward. I keep doing all I can do to make things happen. It's not that you get everything right. It's that you don't quit when you get it wrong. It's not that you're always successful. It means you try even when you find yourself defeated. I never quit. I keep going. I continue on and on just like a marathon. And I wonder how many of you have figured out that life many times is just like a marathon. Not in the simplest sense that things keep just going and going, but along life's path, there are places that you celebrate before and places that you struggle. There are milestones that you can appreciate along the way. In your marathon, there are 26.2 miles. So there's a marker for mile five, there's a recognition of mile 15, there's a recognition of mile 20, but you don't stop just because you hit the milestone. You keep moving. You keep moving because the 20th mile is not the finish line. You keep moving because you're not done because you haven't crossed the tape. So even when you have accomplished something, you have to keep moving forward. So the question is for us this morning, to my brothers and sisters, what keeps you motivated? What's the thing that keeps you in the race? Because if you're honest about it, as much as there are milestones to celebrate, there are also obstacles that we dread. There are roadblocks that frustrate us. There are individuals that will attempt to hinder us. But just like Nipsey, the determining factor is that you don't quit. That we keep going. We keep pushing. We keep hustling. Because the promise is even in our accomplishments, we can get weary. The promise is even in our victories, we can get tired. That, but the, even as we move forward, the goal is not to quit. To keep moving forward until the ultimate goal is reached, that the promise of God is fulfilled. There will be times when life's journey will get us exhausted. There will be times when we'll convince ourselves that the best thing to do is to quit. But if we continue to trust God in the process, we can see that God is still with us and working things out in the process. So the assignment is not to quit, but the assignment is to press on because God is still pressing with us. In this season of pandemic, in this moment of frustration, there are times where we will all want to give in and just give up to what's going on around us. But I want to encourage you today that you can't quit. You can't throw in the towel because that's going to make the difference between you and somebody else, is that you've trusted God enough to see what the end is going to be. But I know the road is not easy. I know that there are people who are frustrating you, but if you remember that the Lord is still working with you, lace up your shoes and get focused because the marathon continues. Journey with me in the text to see that the, for the marathon to continue, you have to understand the responsibility of your faith. See, Jeremiah is having a very candid conversation with God. Because there are some things that are on his mind. Jeremiah wants to make clear to God that he understands the Lord's power and recognizes that God's goodness has been realized. Jeremiah says, Lord, you've always been righteous. You've always been good. You've always answered, and you've always been faithful. Jeremiah can recognize the places where God has been a blessing on the journey. He says, you've always been righteous when I bring a case before you. In other words, God, you've been fair and you've been balanced. But when it comes, i got an issue, God. I want to talk with you. Uh, that's not my issue about your righteousness. But I do have an issue I want to talk to you about. <laughs> Jeremiah does have a pause when he talks about, here it is, God's consistency. God, you're good. God, you're righteous. God, you answer. God, you're faithful. But if I can have a word with you about how consistent you are, I know that when you answer, you always work it out. But God, right now, I'm confused in the direction that you're going. That's what he says right here in the first verse. He gives God credit for his righteousness, but then he throws a little holy shade 
It says, but God, I'd like you to speak about your justice. And before we go too far in this moment, how many of you have said, God, I know when you show up, you show out, but sometimes I wonder about your timing. God, I wonder if your consistency, I'm trying to figure it out. I know you're good, and I know you're faithful, and I know you can deliver a blessing, but sometimes, God, I wonder what you're thinking when you're working things out. I wonder sometimes, God, about the method you use to bless me. And here's the thing, Jeremiah got a pretty good argument. Jeremiah wants to know, what's up with all this madness that's taking place around me? I mean, if you're a good God, why am I noticing so much corruption and wickedness? I'm in the text, Jeremiah asks, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do the faithless live at ease? Watch this, Jeremiah is trying to live faithfully. He's walking in the way that honors God. He's trying to do the best he can with what he has. It's not always an easy ride either. Being faithful means that it costs something, but he's working through it. He's doing what he has to do. He's trusting God, but some days are good and some days are not so good, but he's trusting in God and he still has joy. But then he looks around and sees those who have no respect for God, who have no appreciation for the Lord and who have little regard for God's purpose and God's plan. In fact, he says they act kind of wicked Lord and they seem to be doing better than I'm doing what's up with that God I'm doing what you've asked me to do and I got to struggle and the people who don't follow you and do what they want to do seem to be doing better why do the wicked seem to prosper why do those who seem to have no faith they live with such ease in their lives what does it seem like the wicked do better than the faithful do why does it seem like doing the right thing always seems to mean you suffer the most? Why does it seem like those who don't care about anything and anybody seem to do better than those who care about listening to God? I thought this was supposed to make sense. I thought this relationship with the Lord was supposed to make things easier. I thought my life would be fuller, but people don't care about anything, seem to have all the fun, and it seems like I'm stuck doing all the work. And the only question I have for you, God, is why? Why do I have to think about others and wait while others don't care about anything and they get ahead? Why do I have to take my time and be patient when others knock things over and do what they want to get where they want? Why do I have to forgive people who aren't really sorry and who want to do things and then apologize later? Why do I have to apologize to people who didn't mean me any good in the first place? Why do I have to love people who act mean and ugly, who don't even want my love or my help? Why do I have to be the bigger person all the time and stop and, and act like uh, sometimes it feels like this stuff doesn't even get me anything? Why do I have to be the one who always has to do better and be better and act better and rise above Why? when other folk who do what they want seem to be doing better than I'm doing all the time. Why can people talk about loving God but then turn around and treat people like they don't matter? Why can people talk about the love of God and then turn around to try to defend a police officer who murdered a man by putting his, neck, uh, putting his knee on his neck? Why can people who are supposed to be helping other people keep changing the story and no one calls them on it? How can a president who talks about draining a swamp put more slime and disease and pollution in the swamp than there was before and nothing happens to him? Has anybody ever asked the question, God, why do those who don't care about you and you don't do anything about it, but when I get angry or upset, my whole day is ruined? Somebody can commit murder and they can get away with it. I don't forgive somebody and you messing with me for the rest of the week. That ain't fair. Has anybody ever asked God, why do other people seem to get, pass, get a pass when you always hold me responsible? Can I push it? Because look, we gonna keep it real today. It gets worse. <laughs> Jeremiah is upset because here's the really bad news. God put them there. I'm in the text, verse 2. He said, you planted them, and they've taken root. He said, I'm upset that they seem to be getting away with it, and it seems that you put them in my path to begin with. 
God, you put these people in my way. You put them in my path. Why did you do that to me? Jeremiah says they grow and bear fruit, meaning they have an effect on everything. You are always on their lips, but you're far from their hearts, meaning they talk about you all the time, but they don't live like they know you at all. They talk like they love the Lord. They use language, but they don't live the lifestyle. That may be perfect attendance in church, but they still miss the message of Jesus. They talk about a love for God, but then they throw me in jail for a traffic stop. They undereducate my community. They keep me in a food desert. They can't provide adequate health care. Who are these people? Because they don't come from you. Jeremiah said, the people are faking, and yet you put them in the way. He says, yet you know me. You know how much I love you. You know how much I try, but you always tested me. You're always putting something in my way. You're always giving me a rougher road to climb. Seems easier for the people who don't care about you, but you make it harder for those who love you. God, tell me what your plan is. I got a question. I take issue with your method and your consistency. I'm trying to figure this thing out. I know you're faithful, but you don't always seem fair. Okay, a couple of things, and then we'll move on. First, God ain't trying to be fair. God is trying to get you to be fruitful. God knows the difference between the different needs of different things, and God doesn't give everybody the same material to work with. God doesn't want you to have the same as everybody else. God wants you to be fruitful with what you have. There's, this is where our faith must come into focus. If you concentrate on what others have and what others are doing, I can miss the moments of the stuff that I need to be doing. Can I help somebody today? Don't spend so much time on what you should that you miss your need. Don't spend so much time on what you think should that you miss the need. Don't spend so much time on what you think somebody else should be doing that you miss what you need to be doing. Some of us spend a whole lot of time on should. I should have this. I should be here. I should have gotten that. I should have done this. But we spend so much time on I should that we miss what we need to do. And the reality is, no matter what should or should not happen, there are some things that still need to be done. <laughs> and being focused helps us on what needs to be done. Second thing, what God does with you, here it is, what God does with you has never been based on what God is doing with somebody else. You missed it. What somebody does and what their assignment is in God can be two different things. What God is doing with you has never been based on what God is doing with somebody else. Somebody who looks prosperous does not mean that they're faithful. It does not mean that they're in God's will. It does not mean that God is pleased with them. We have all had this assumption that because they have things or because they do what they want or because they got certain room or because that somehow or another they're better off when the reality is they can be doing all that stuff and still be outside of God. God's will. Prosperity and material success doesn't mean you are under God's favor and your blessing is not connected to somebody else's behavior. If God instructed you to be fair, be fair because it's connected to your blessing. If God instructed you to be forgiven, be forgiven because it's connected to your blessing. If God has instructed you to be grateful, be grateful because it's connected to your blessing. If God has instructed you to be kind, be kind because it's going to do something and affect your blessing. The fact that somebody else doesn't do these things is connected to what happens to them. You got to do what's connected to God working with you and through you. Don't get too lost in what others do because what they do will never bless your situation like you can. They can act up if they want to. That's not how you get your blessing. They can cheat if they want to. That's not how your blessing comes. They can act ugly and treat people mean. That's not how you sleep at night. They can be backstabbers and mean spirited all they like. But what I know is that if I want the Lord to show up, I want to be faithful to what the Lord has given me to do. I can't get what I need acting like other folks. i got to do what the Lord has called me to do. I've got to be responsible with my own faith. It might take me longer, true, but the blessing is sweeter. 
might take me a little longer to come around, but the blessing is better. It may seem like it's forever, but I've declared that it's worth the wait. Might be what others expect me to do, but when my head hits the pillow, I feel better about myself because I know I'm in the step and in line with what God would have me to do. And as long as I'm in the will of the Lord, I'm going to trust that the Lord will provide and make sure that everything is all right. Understand uh, what it is about faith journey. Uh, uh, in the continuing of your marathon. But second thing is understand in the continuing of your marathon, understand the reality of your fatigue. Understand the reality of your fatigue. Understand that you will get tired. Jeremiah is asking the question, why does it seem like the wicked do so well when those who are trying to do right have to struggle? The question is a valid one. But Jeremiah asked this question not because he's jealous. Uh, he may be confused, but he ain't jealous. No, Jeremiah asked the question because he's tired. I'm in the text. He says, God, this question of why do the wicked prosper, they pretend to know you, but they don't have you in their heart, and yet you know me, you know my heart, and you test me all the time. There it is. Jeremiah is tired because he's being tested. Look at what he says in the fourth verse. How long will you lie, uh, let the land lie parched and the grass in every field withered? How long will we continue to toil and nothing comes up? He says it's withered because those who live in it are wicked. The animals and birds have perished. Jeremiah is saying there are no resources. That those who are on the land have taken everything from the land. The people are being tested. Jeremiah, a prophet in the time of exile, witnesses those forces of Babylon taking over everything and leaving nothing behind. Jeremiah, a prophet who warned the people to repent, is witnessing the taking of the land and witnessing the people suffering. Jeremiah sees the land get stripped of everything it possesses because the people who are there and supposed to be in charge don't care anything about it. Jeremiah's cry is simply how long? How long will it be before some kind of change happens? How long will it be before God steps in and does something? Those who are in control don't care about who it affects. All they care about is what they can get, and the people are suffering through it all. Now, on one side, the prophet can say, I warned you. I told you so. I told you to repent. I told you to be careful. I told you to watch your steps. I told you to get out there and vote. So the reality may be that you brought this on yourself. That's one perspective. You brought this on yourself, but still, as a servant of God, Jeremiah is still upset and in pain when he sees God's people suffering. He said, the talk is people are saying he will not see what happened to us. God can't see what's going on. God has turned his eyes away from us. Oh, there's moments when you're going through some stuff when we don't believe God sees us. Oh, I know I'm not the only one here who believes that there are some times in your life when you're going through some stuff and you believe God has turned his head away from you. That there are some moments when you say, I, I, God is not even paying attention. God is not even noticing. God does not even see. God keeps us in certain places that are uncomfortable and unpleasant, and we convince ourselves that God doesn't know what's going on. How long will the land be parched? How long will the grass of every field be withered? How long will the things get taken away piece by piece? How long will we have to hear about this virus and it taking the lives of so many? How long will we have to struggle and hospitals are running out of space and running out of PPE because the government isn't looking to replenish anything in need? How long will we have to be exposed to people who don't want to wear masks and the idea is politicized and used as a tactic for Republican support while people are getting infected every day? How long will governors act like there is not a surge and won't look to correct improper behavior of their citizens? How long will the people be lied to as they see the White House changes their numbers of infected just because the president will think it'll help him win an election? How long will institutions of politics play games and try, like in Georgia, to force Atlanta not to issue a mandated order for masks so people can be safe? How long? 
long before medical professions will give up because government is not working with them to literally save the lives of citizens. How long will you have to put up with a president who says the police kill white people too? And the flag is about freedom of speech to bait his base into thinking that there is no issue. How long, Jeremiah, ask the question, how long do we have to endure all of this madness? Jeremiah is tired, tired of things looking like they aren't getting any better. Does anybody know what it's like to get tired because things don't look any better? Anybody know what it is to be worn out because it seems like there's no change? Or even still feel like God is not noticing what's happening to you? Well, if I can encourage you for just a moment, I can tell you that I know what it is to be worn out. I know what it is to feel exhausted. I know that sometimes you feel like God is standing on the sideline just watching and not getting involved in the action. But I'm here to tell you that God is not a spectator, that God is an active participant in the process. Pastor, I know what you're saying, but how can God be an active participant in the process when so much is going on, when so much is happening? How can God be involved? Jeremiah already said that the Lord is testing him. He said, you test my thoughts about you, meaning there are some things that you have to put me through, that God is involved because God is listening. God hears your petition. God hears you when you cry out. God hears you when you worry. God hears you in your struggle because God is keeping you through it all. The wicked have not destroyed you uh, because God is with you. The plans of the wicked have not worn out because God is with you. God hears you in the think of it all because God is working things out and God is still active. I remember, I remember when I voted last month, I voted when I voted two months ago at the jail, uh, when I was at the jail doing some work and I left the jail and then I uh, came over to the church. I spent some time at the church, and then I went home, and I was exhausted. I was just thinking about getting home and sitting down. And I went home, I sat down, I ate, I chilled out. I was talking to my wife, I was talking to my kids, and all, and all day my wife was sending me texts saying, make sure you vote today. All day she was sending texts, make sure you vote today. Send a text to the whole family, make sure you vote today. So I'm sitting there, I am just ate. I'm feeling good, feeling good and stuff. I'm relaxed. I had a long day. I've been to the jail, been to the church. I've been running around. I've been cooling out. And my wife says, did you vote today? Oh, man, I forgot. Everything going on. I forgot to vote. I forgot to vote. It's 15 minutes until 7. It's 15 minutes till 7 o'clock. I say that. I say, man, I ain't never going to make it. She said, well, go ahead and try. So I put on my shoes, get in the car, then I pull in to my voting station, and I jump out, and I'm running to the door because I just know they're going to close up. And the lady says, slow down, slow down, sugar. You're going to hurt yourself. Oh, little lady says, slow down, sugar. You're going to hurt yourself. I said, can I still vote? I said, can I still vote? Mother, is it too late? She looked at me and said, here it is. Here's your shout. She said, as long as the door is still open. You got a chance to make it count. I just chose somebody just missed your shout. God hears you. And even if it doesn't seem like it, as long as the door is open, you still got a chance to make it count. That God says you got a chance as long because I'm keeping the door open for you and the possibility is still there. And as long as the possibility is still there, you still got a chance to make it all count. So understand, it's about Jeremiah's fatigue. Even in the marathon, you're going to get tired sometimes. But here's the final thing. We leave you alone, let you go. Here it is, that as the marathon continues, you got to recognize that on the journey, you got to recognize the fight that, that is within you. See, Jeremiah ain't doubting that God is with him. Jeremiah understands God is with him. Jeremiah wants to know how long the suffering is going to take place. God, it's not about whether or not you're with me. It ain't about whether or not you're a deliverer. I want to know how long I got to stay in this mess. Somebody understands what I'm talking about. God, I don't deny that you can bring us out. God, I don't deny that this thing can be over. I don't deny that you can wipe coronavirus away. I don't deny that you're going to come with a vaccine. The question I have is how long we got to wait. Right? Jeremiah wants to know how long the suffering is going to be happening. Wants to know how long it's going to endure. Right? Why can't you just fix it, Jesus? Why can't you just fix it? Right? The issue is this. God gives a response. But it's not the response Jeremiah is looking for. Oh, yeah. You got to be careful when you ask God stuff. Because God will answer. It just might not be the answer you expected. How, how do you know God is with you? 
because God's got an answer. He just, you just need to be prepared to hear the answer God's going to give. God responds not to the issue of deliverance, but to the issue of patience. Uh, God doesn't tell Jeremiah when the suffering is going to end. He tells him that this is just a preparation for what's coming. Listen to what the Lord says. He says to Jeremiah, if you have raced on foot with men and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? God says, if you run in now and you tire, what you going to do when you really got to keep up? Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. God, what are you trying to say? I'm telling you I'm tired. I'm telling you I would like for you to tell me when the suffering is over. And you telling me that if I can't keep up now, what I'm going to do when things get harder? God, you're telling me it's going to get harder after this? God is telling you, yeah, there's going to be some places, there's going to be some levels, there are going to be some places that you're going to get elevated to and promoted to that are going to be harder than this. But the shout is, you're going to get promoted to those places. If you're faithful where you are, God will promote you to the next place. Can I suggest to you that it's not the answer that Jeremiah is looking for. Jeremiah knew that he was in the middle of a rough situation, but he did not know that there were going to be more ahead. But can, how can I help you today? I know that we can look at this thing and get kind of depressed. But can I help you see this thing another way? God says, if you race with men on foot and they've worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets of the Jordan? God is not just talking about your things of increase, but God is saying that you are preparing yourself for what's about to happen. God is saying, I'm not telling you this to upset you. I'm telling you this to train you so you'll be prepared to handle what's coming your way. That sometimes your training is a test for what's about to come. And God says this race you're running is going to prepare you for the race you're going to run in the future. Can I help some of y'all? The things you're going through right now is helping you prepare for what you're about to face and what you're about to go through. In other words, don't get caught up on this because this is a light affliction. God's got something for you and it's going to prepare for you. You'll be ready for it when you have to face it. God says the level you're on right now is just the training ground, but the level you're on your way to is really where it's going to step up. How can you compete with the horses? God is saying you're going to come a time where you're going to be able to run neck and neck with some of the strongest people in the world. You're going to be able to keep up with some people who got twice as much as you have. You're going to be able to stand tall in the presence of folk uh, who have thought you don't need to be there, meaning there's going to be a time in your life where you will do things that you would never think that you would be able to do. That's why you got to keep running. That's why you got to stay faithful. That's why you got to keep praying. That's why you got to keep working because you're training yourself for something bigger that's about to happen that's about to blow other people's minds but it won't happen if you don't keep pushing you got to stay focused in the right now you're just preparing for what is the next moment and you're going to pass if you stay faithful with flying colors keep pushing and keep fighting you still have time on the clock <laughs> learn from this moment learn from what you've seen because you can work it through and get stronger with each race. The marathon continues. If they're in the race, you can't slow down. Uh, you got to run all the way through the end. You got to run through the finish line. You got to operate like you've been there before. You got to operate like you've seen it and like it's worked out for you before. You got to operate like you've been prepared for what's happening. Uh, I was talking to a good friend of mine, good buddy of mine who was watching his stepdaughter, who is six years old, taking care of his stepdaughter. His wife was out of town, taking care of his stepdaughter. And um, he, he's, it was just him and his six-year-old stepdaughter. And I was like, man, you got to get the hang of that thing. Because uh, he said, it's wearing me out. He said, my kids, my children are adults. He said, so this six-year-old life is wearing me out. He said, a lot of energy. It's a lot of energy. He said, I do naps, but six-year-olds don't know where naps live. So 
was wearing me out. And I, I said, so every day I called him. I said, man, how's it going? He said, Lord, have mercy. We doing all right? I survived. I said, good news. He, he said, how did the breakfast go? He said, the breakfast went well. I said, how did the lunch go? He said, everything went smooth. He said, I got to the end of the night. He said, I told I said, you did good. He said, you did good today. The day, so we going to watch a movie. So I said, what you want to do? She said, I want to watch a movie. She said, okay, well, let's pick the movie. She said, we'll see this movie. She said, I'm not sure about this movie. I'm not sure that I've seen this. I'll watch this. So they started putting, he said, put the movie in, and they watched, they watched a little bit. And as they sitting on the couch watching the movie, it said about an hour passed, and the stepdaughter says, oh, yeah, I've seen this one before. He was like, really? Really? We've been sitting here a whole hour, and you've been watching this, and now you realize that you've seen this before? We were trying to watch something that neither of us have seen before, and now you say you've been here an hour, and you've already seen it. You say you remember that you've seen it. He said, small this is what she said, and it shouted me. She said, she looked at me and said, sometimes you have to watch it for a little while to remember that you've seen it before. Some of y'all missing your shout. A six-year-old just blessed you and you missed it. When you're going through some stuff, sometimes you got to watch and say, I've seen this. I've been here before, and I know that the Lord can take me out of it. Sometimes you got to watch it for a little while. Sometimes you got to sit there for a little while and remind yourself, I've seen this before, and I know that God is going to work it out. I know that God could handle it with the Lord on my, on my side. I remind myself that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I, I remind myself that a weeping may endure for a night, but joy shows up in the morning. I remind myself that I can still do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I remind myself when I'm in the middle of the situation, when I find myself in the training, I tell myself I've been here before. And as long as I've been here before, I know that the Lord will see me through. The Lord will guide me. The the Lord will strengthen me. The Lord will sustain me. And as long as I've got the Lord on my side, I'm sure that everything will be all right. The marathon continues. Keep on running. Keep on going. Because God's not finished with you yet. If you're running on foot with men right now and they tire you out, how you going to do at your next level? How you going to do with the four-legged creatures? Because that's where I'm going to place you. I'm going to place you in some places to do some supernatural things with you. You just got to believe that I'm working with you. Don't give up. Keep on pushing. Be consistent. Don't quit. I know you're tired. I know you're over coronavirus. I know you're over political co conversation. I know you're over jargon. I know you're over 45. I know you're over all of those things. But don't quit. Because God says there's another level coming for you. He said, God says, you've been here before, and I brought you out so I can bring you out again. Amen. We're grateful. We're grateful. We're grateful for God speaking. We're grateful for God moving in this moment. Like we said, we were to be faithful and continue to be faithful even uh, in our giving and even in our faithfulness and in, in worship in general. But we want to be faithful in our invitation. So we extend this invitation to someone who may be watching virtually, somebody out there across uh, the World Wide Web, across the internet, across social media scales and levels, who may be looking for a church home, who may be looking to be strengthened, who may be looking for a relationship with the Lord, who may be looking for an opportunity and a place to grow. We want to say this place is for you. We believe that New Calvary is a place of liberation. It is a place of empowerment. It's a place of transformation. And if that's you right now, we just want to say we just want you to say God I need you call on and say God I need you God I'm looking for you for your hand and direction God uh, I find myself in places where I can't do it all by myself I recognize my limits I recognize my limitations but God I'm putting it all in your hands I'm asking that you would accept me, that your son Jesus Christ has died for my sins. Your son Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior and example for my life. And God, as you continue to lead and guide me, I will in all things follow and do my best to grow. So as I continue to grow, walk with me. If I need to find a church home wherever I am, help me to do that. If I want to connect with a new Calvary church, help me to do that. God, I want to be in relationship with you. And I believe you love me enough to accept me into your kingdom. 
So God, right now, we thank God for you and we applaud for you. We give you praise. We give God praise for your decision this time, this moment in which you share. And as you continue to grow in the Lord, you can call New Calvary Baptist Church. You can call New Calvary and you can uh, get in contact with us. We would love to be a church family. I'd love to share with you as your pastor as we just continue to grow and see what God has in store. And so as we prepare to depart, as we prepare to leave, we ask that you would again keep yourselves safe. We would ask that you would prepare yourselves for tomorrow uh, for our prayer line on Monday at 8 a.m. We are grateful for all of you sharing and tuning in. And as we prepare to depart from this place, we say, God, we love you. God, we're grateful for this opportunity of worship, grateful for the time in which you put us together. So God, as we continue to depart from this place, never let us be away from your presence. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be grateful unto you. May the Lord place his countenance upon you that you might have peace both now and forevermore. And the people who love God in the spirit of fellowship and connection. We say amen. We say amen and amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time. We love you. You can't do anything about it. Take care. Be good. Peace.